Buddy, can you see me? Can you hear me? If you can, let me know how it sounds. I did the levels here, but there's, you know, all sorts of factors that can go into it. So uh, thanks for joining. This is large format live, a little bit different than the uh, more structured large format Fridays, which if you're not a subscriber to the channel, you should probably check that out. I'm your host, Matt Marash, and yeah, today we're going to take some questions that some viewers have sent in. If you have any questions, I'll try to get to questions as I go through the long list of emailed ones. If you have any questions about anything large format, this is kind of uh, an open session. I'm going to be up for an hour or until the cameras go dead, and yeah, we'll see, uh, we'll see how questions uh, go. I see I've got 20 folks live. Hey out there, everybody. And we had folks already writing with some questions, so I'm going to kind of just get right to those. Oh, but first of, first of all, what are all these cables? This, this doesn't look very analog, very large format photography. Well, it takes a decent amount of gear to get going with all of this uh, stuff. Uh, this gear is my monitor, so I can see the different cameras. By the way, I have a few different cameras. I've got camera one, and I've got, oh, geez, you can see even more of the mess coming from that right there. My goodness. Um, so yeah, just kind of uh, kind of some fun different looks. And then I also have my screen I can share with you for, uh, for any questions that are coming up. If you, uh, if you can see everything, everything sounds good, give me the thumbs up or just uh, you know, say anything in the chat. I also have Super Chats enabled. So if you like what you see, you can always, uh, anything that goes through Super Chat just gets funded right back into the channel. So I appreciate that too. All right, sweet. All right, David's here. Hey, David, I, I've got your question. It's coming right up. And Laura says thumbs. All right, sweet. We are good to go. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, wait, I need the branding. We got to have the branding. There we go. We can see my banner now, large format live. It's like official now, right? It's like breaking news. Anyway, cool. So first question we have is from... Mr. David M. And David writes, Dear Matt, first of all, thanks for the channel on large format photography. You're a very honest and passionate person that motivates me to jump into the medium. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. I'm a fine art photographer from Barcelona that's worked in digital cameras for over 10 years. And now all the crazy pandemic situation and not having to make any new images since I find myself trying to change the way I make images. I feel like that's a lot of us right now, David. For the kind of photographs I make, and the kind of work I want to make in the coming time, I feel like I should try a larger format that would allow me to retain more detail and work better on the prints. I also want to slow down and I'm highly interested in developing more work on the landscape, so four by five. The thing I'm having a hard time deciding what to do is to get. I have a small budget and I'm quite picky, so the options for me are reduced to either a Wista VX, which is a folding field camera, or the Intrepid Mark IV. And the truth is, I'd love to get the Wista, but I'm a bit afraid of its weight sometimes. Sometimes I go for month plus through hikes with my camera. What do you think about the Wista? The other option at the higher end would be a Chamonix, but I don't have that kind of money since I'd need to buy everything else to get started. The fluff, the film, the holders, the lenses, that whole sort of thing. I like the Intrepid, but I hate plastic parts, like so much. And the thing is that I find it quite hard to spot Nagaokas and Deerdorfs here in Spain. I even thought about finding good metal knobs for the Intrepid or even find somewhere else to machine them. Do you know where I can get those kind of knobs or the technical name? What would be your choice if you were starting? Do you know of any other cameras that I should check up on? Thanks for your attention, and it's great you opened the email for folks like me. All the best, David. Well, David, that's, uh, you know, that's quite a question. There's a lot of things to unpack within that, and by the way, you already have my response. Uh, so I'm not just gonna read my response for it. I'm gonna give you kind of my thoughts and share it just kind of like my thought process for picking that. So for the folks of you that don't already subscribe to the channel or, or don't know my background, I have a background in selling cameras. I've been in the camera industry for the last seven years and I've helped steer a lot of folks into new and used large format camera purchases. Um, and not just ones because, oh, hey, you should get this camera because I wanna sell a lot of them. It's really just my job to make sure we can get you into one that is comfortable for you and looks good. All right, we got Mark, we got John, we got all sorts of folks in the chat, perfect. <laughs> Laura wants to know if she should bring a dog out, jeez. So 
Camera wise, I have definitely sold more Wistas than Intrepids for folks getting started in large format. And I feel comfortable in Wistas, not, uh, not for a small factor due to the fact that my, uh, my buddy Tariq, who we did our last large format live at his studio, uh, we were shooting on a Wista. It's actually a second Wista. The only thing that took out his first one was a giant background stand kit like the one I have back here crashing down on it. It took that much to judo chop right through the camera. And even then, replacing a little bit of wood, he was good to go. So I'm a big fan of the Wistas. Um, I have a Takahara field camera that I personally shoot with, and I just really like the look and feel of it. The weight is not so much a bother because it's a pretty rock solid camera. The biggest difference though is if you do want replacement parts, Wistas are incredibly expensive brand new. You can actually still buy those brand new. I was really surprised, I looked it up. You can still special order Wistas from B&H and Adorama, but they're over three grand. So that's a big night and day kind of price comparison. So use Wista or new Intrepid. And I totally get that you don't like the, the plastic parts going on there, David. It, it doesn't feel good, right? There's all this really good build and everything, but you got to make trade-offs for the weight. And because you mentioned that you go on month-long trips, I never do more than a day-in, day-out pack-in with all of my large format gear. So if that's the case, the Intrepid might just seem like the best fit because you've got, you've got all this other stuff to haul along that extra two to two and a half pounds difference between an Intrepid and a Wista kitted out could be the difference between getting that extra mile to get that cool shot and not having anything to start. And this is, you know, since we're talking a budget camera, we're not even really having that conversation about versatility of movements and oh, how well does one, uh, one compare for bellows and all that extra stuff. I really think the Intrepids, once they hit three, were a really great starter camera and the price point, you just can't beat it. It's a brand new camera. They have a whole system now. They're coming out with a five by seven. They have an eight by 10. It's pretty decently fleshed out. There are some camera companies that come out with newer versions of their cameras very quickly, and they get widely criticized because their users are testing out the cameras for them. They're really just continuously improving. The Intrepids, I really think they hit their stride with the later models, and that would be the one that I would go with. You also mentioned custom machining, and I wanted to touch on that because I have machining. And really it's just mixed because it's expensive. And I know running a machine shop, there's a lot of overhead, the CNC mills and the custom dies and everything. They are incredibly, incredibly pricey. So it stands to reason that if you want something custom machined, that's going to blow your budget wide open. There has to be a substantial will and a lot of money behind getting something custom machined. So if you don't like the plastic knobs on the Intrepid, you can always have that machined later on. If you have a buddy with a CNC though, you might as well have them build you a new camera <laughs> instead of just uh, getting the tiny little brass knobs. And I don't think they have specific names. They're just like uh, rack, like brass rack knobs. Uh, I know when we still sold Wista, Takahara and Ebony at Midwest Photo, those were almost interchangeable. I know Wistas and Takaharas I could interchange parts on and even some of the Ebony four by fives, I could put a really expensive Ebony piece on a Takahara and it would work pretty well. But I would say considering getting started of those two, this is one of those rare times that I would say go with the Intrepid because you still have to buy all that other stuff. And that's a really great point. If you're gonna spend money on anything when you're getting started, spend it on the film. Get some good film to start with, um, learn, on, learn on some really good stuff. And then once you're kind of confident that you can get the shot, then you can kind of get some, you know, some used film, some X-ray film, and really just kind of learn, learn the ropes, learn the dance with your camera. If you know you're going to make a lot of mistakes, yeah, you can start out with paper or x-ray film or something really cheap. But I also like learning on good stuff because you only know, you know there's one person to blame if you don't get uh, the shot you're looking for, right? The, oh, geez, what happened? Oh, okay, it was probably me. This film is bulletproof. So uh, that's my take on David's question there. Um, all right. Is that Einar or Enar? The any 300 millimeter lens you would recommend for an eight by 10 field. I'm going to, can I copy that? Oh, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna report you. I just wanna copy your question. I'm gonna take your question. I'm gonna add it to, uh, I'm gonna add it to the queue. You guys can see I have quite a queue of questions coming up. So I'm gonna add that right there. I'm gonna add this one. Sweet, okay. So David, actually, I'm moving from one David to the next. So um, that was David in Spain. And the other David, we actually have a, 
uh, we actually have in the chat. So this is cool. This is like going to be like real feedback. We're probably going to like end up arguing through the chat or something. <laughs> uh, I hope not. Okay. So uh, this is from David P. And he says, hi, Matt. First of all, I recently found your YouTube channel and enjoy uh, and thoroughly enjoying it. Uh, thanks for that. Secondly, I, I look at your work here on the website and doing good. Oh, well, thanks. I'm a landscape guy. Uh, David, I have to say I've visited your site many times uh, since we started conversing. There's some absolutely outstanding work on there too. Um, so David says, I recently sold my Fujifilm GFX 50S. What? You sold the 50S? No, I can see why that is. Um, the GFX is a beautiful camera. It's some awesome specifications and the dynamic range and color and stuff is awesome. Just a different feeling with a piece of film. All right, I, I won't interrupt anymore. I'm gonna keep reading. Um, it's a very nice camera, but try as hard as I could, I could never get that beautiful tonal range in black and white that I see with film. I'm right there with you, man. I have worked with the GFS, the 50S, the 50R, and the GFX 100. Nowhere near as much as I want to, but of those three, the 100 is the one that I feel like gives large format a run for its money, but still nothing compared to the feeling of it, right? That tactile hands-on deal. Um, I don't have enough room for a dark room, so I'm gonna be shooting four by five and scanning it and then printing an inkjet. I seriously considered going eight by 10 and making contact prints in platinum palladium, but decided to start with four by five and make contact prints platinum later. I totally agree with that call. This is one of those do as I say, not as I do type uh, Q and A's, just because I started with eight by 10, but that's because I had access to an eight by 10. I didn't have to pay that upfront cost. So I got to spend a little extra time and money on assembling lenses, holders, and film. If I had to go from scratch, four by five by far is a sweeter choice. Okay, so I'm looking at two Chamonix four by fives. One's a 45 N1, which folds up like a regular field camera, and the other one's the 45 H1, which is a, um, a non-folder. So it's a, it compacts, but it doesn't fold up or into itself like standard uh, field type cameras. And, uh, long story short, we had a back and forth. Uh, we started, uh, I, I think we're probably on like email four or five. And after I was making recommendations on the different Chamonix, I said, oh, hey, I brought to mind a Toyo. And it seems like you're really on the fence. Um, and I totally get it. It's, it really all depends on, you know, what you're trying to capture. And I did want to bring one extra bit in from your, uh, your email question, because I think this um, does start to paint like a broader picture of what you're trying to do. And um, I think it really helps with that. So the other like important part of this letter right here, the last little bit, I do landscape photography and I don't see myself using anything wider than about a 24 millimeter. And the longest lens I use is around 105 um, or 120 millimeter on 35 millimeter full frame. He also pointed me to this absolutely beautiful picture that he has already taken at Point Lobos. And wow, I mean, it is like, it is sweet. Let me see if I can open it up. That is an awesome, awesome print. David, if you don't do, if you don't end up getting the chance to do this shot on four by five again, like I think you can rest a happy man knowing that you've already made such a beautiful picture. Like that's awesome. But I totally get that feeling where, oh, I wonder, I shot this thing on a smaller format. I wonder what it's gonna look like on large format. That's like the first thing a lot of us do as soon as we figure out like, okay, we, we know we can get an okay shot. Let's see if, what we can do with it. Let's kind of like start to push the envelope with knowns. Um, I know you keep going back to the, um, to the H1. And so folks have some kind of like idea on what these different cameras look like. I'm also gonna open up Chamonix's uh, website so you guys can take a look. Uh, Chamonix, by the way, is a Chinese manufacturer of large format cameras, and they have like a really good selection. They got the N1, the N2, F2, like all these different kind of riffs on a classic system of folding field cameras. Their quality has shot up astronomically over the years, and I really like where they're going with their cameras systems. And they make it all the way up to ultra large format. I mean, look at that beast, 20 by 24, a monster. Oh my goodness. Okay, so anyway, um, the H1 is an interesting choice. And the only reason I had pause on this one when I was recommending this one to you before, David, is it does not have a lot, a lot of, doesn't have a lot of bellows extension. 
And typically non-folders are specialty cameras for really, really wide fields of view. So if you in the email were like, you know what, I love going wide. I love going 14 millimeter equivalent, 12 millimeter equivalent. You can get there uh, with a non-folder without having to go to crazy, you know, recessed lens boards and bag bellows and that sort of thing because that camera is super wide angle. This one will just barely get there for the 300 millimeter-ish equivalent lens that you would need. And I'm just looking at the, I know they always post their bellows draw somewhere. Oh yeah, here we go. So there's a little table on the bellows draw that it goes out to. So our max bellows on this bad boy is 350 millimeters. That's Ken, whoa, uh oh. I didn't wanna go, to, I almost went super meta for a second there. We almost entered the matrix. Hopefully, um, hopefully we, yeah, don't do that again, geez. All right, oh, we got some other questions. I'll try and come back to those uh, on that, guys. All right. <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh man, lots of questions are pouring in. Guys, I promise I am going to get to them in timestamp order as soon as we, as soon as we get through this one. But the big thing with, um, with that, uh, that 45H, it doesn't have a lot of draw. So if we put a 105, 120 millimeter equivalent, which would be like a 300 millimeter, maybe 250 is maybe just a little bit wider than we'd want. If that subject is any closer than maybe 15, 20 feet, we're gonna run out of bellows. And the other thing about bellows is it's not about what's the max that the sheet goes to, it's also what's comfortable for the camera. These bellows a lot of times are just glued onto a frame or glued and stapled if it's like a really old camera. And my opinion, you don't wanna be stretching it to its absolute limit. If you're at the limit all the time and you just need to go a little bit further, now you are kind of tearing at the camera. And tearing at the camera, we could get the bellows frame kind of messed up. The bellows might not fold back in properly. So I never like to push the absolute limit of a camera. I'll get a camera that's specialty for it. So in the case of if I'm using a super, super long lens, there's two lenses that I don't even take out in the field. They only go on my Cinar because my Cinar has 38 inches of bellows or my, uh, my Takahara has 24 inches or 600 millimeter bellows. So a 600 millimeter lens doesn't make sense unless what I'm fo focusing on is at like exactly infinity. Um, at the end of the day, cameras are a personal choice. So I'm never, one thing I always say uh, in selling cameras is I'm never gonna tell you exactly what to buy, but I'm just gonna lay out the information and the things that you might want to help weigh your decisions. So what is, you know, what's the most importance? Is it gonna be like the budget, the weight, the features? Here, I think what's, uh, what's kind of uh, at the core of this question is like feature set. So does it have the features you're gonna need? And there's definitely some FOMO in here, right? Like we don't wanna get the wrong thing. I haven't recommended anybody a bad camera. There's like very few bad cameras that are left. Like shoddy construction on a large format camera, they don't last long. You know, they, they fall apart. They're not gonna, uh, they're not gonna do something. They're gonna be shaky and you're gonna, it's gonna be out of your mind really, really soon. None of the cameras on Chamonix's website are, are dogs. They're all, they all kind of do one or two things a little bit better or a little bit more efficiently, but they're all pretty sweet. My personal favorite of them is actually, and I think I've mentioned this one back and forth. I'm just kind of a fan of it. I really like the Chamonix F2 because I used to sell a lot of Ebony's to folks because Ebony was like this elevated, oh my gosh, really big deal camera. Well, the 45 F2 has these lovely things on the rear called asymmetrical movements. Asymmetrical movements allow you to, allow you to focus. Uh, this is a little bit of Scheinflug principle, which we're definitely gonna go into in its own separate video, not just what we did in the, uh, the episode seven on movements, but it allows you to Focus to the far, so focus to the far point that you want in sharp focus, apply movements on the rear, and not have to refocus. It's an amazing, amazing thing. I have it on my Cinar camera, I have it on my top. Once you start applying more complex, the movements get, the more that refocusing may need to occur. When you're using asymmetrical or yaw free movements, you're going to get an easier time focusing in the field. It's a feature which essentially on Chamonix, they're charging you an extra one to $200 for. It's worth it. You used to have to pay $3,000 more to get that in uh, like an Ebony or an Arca Swiss camera. Uh, Arca Swiss calls theirs Micrometrics Orbix. 
say that five times fast. <laughs> um, but the Chamonix, like they just give it to you like, yeah, here it is, hundred bucks, whatever. They also have a, lot, a little bit more bellows draw on this model. So that's why I like that. Um, let's see, let's go back to the chat. Has it caught on fire yet? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh yeah, that's right. David just reminded me, he's looking at the, 45, the Toyo 45AX. So Toyos are pretty solid cameras and I've sold quite a few of those to educators over the years because they fold up. They're kind of like tanks. They're like somewhere between a press camera and a field camera. The only downside is when you have something that folds into the bed like that in kind of a clamshell style, those cameras tend to be uh, more restricted in the bellows. So kind of like that H1, you're gonna hit a bellows limit pretty quickly on it. But the cool thing about Toyo is they, uh, in the US, they go through a distributor called Mac Group and they have great customer service. They're out of White Plains, New York. You can call somebody up, they pick up the phone and they can say, yeah, we've got that part and they take care of you. Sometimes with Toyo, you do have to wait eight, nine weeks for something coming out of Japan, which is like, that's an eternity, I know. But at least they're making it. And um, right, well, right now in COVID, they might not be making it, but they're, whatever stock they have, they have and they can, uh, they can allocate to you. So that's, this is where it kind of becomes a personal choice. I'm not gonna say one or the other for sure, but because you mentioned Chamonix right off the bat, I would say if you've got, if you've got the budget and you don't want to blow that budget by going brand spanking new on a Toyo, the Chamonix is gonna be the best bang for your buck considering the movements, the range, everything that you're looking to do um, in a camera. Da, 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 da. Oh man, we have all sorts of good questions. My goodness, guys, I promise I am going to try my best to get through all these. We're about 20 minutes in, but I'm going to shoot to the next question. So David, I wish you the best of luck. I think you'll, I think you're going to land on a good one, no matter which one you go to. All right. So I'm going to jump. All right. Now we have a question from Pedro uh, and Pedro writes, uh, besides requiring shorter bellows distance, what's the difference between a Schneider Telearton, so a telephoto design 270 millimeters and a 270 millimeter uh, non tele lens, or what's known as a just a, a long draw lens, so it's native draw. Uh, will the bokeh be different at the same aperture of a non tele lens of the same focal length? Uh, I'm new with large format and recently purchased a Chamonix F2. Nice, and love the format and the whole ritual to make a picture. Thank you for your reply, and I always look forward to seeing your videos. Well, thank you so much, Pedro. And this one, I actually had to do a little bit of homework on. I'm not sure if I actually replied to the physical email. So I hope you're watching. I'll just send you the link to the video. Uh, so telephoto designed lenses are ones that are usually a little bit chunkier and hourglass designed. There are extra elements. Uh, there are extra elements in the lens that allow you to achieve the same image at a shorter bellows draw. That's essentially what a telephoto design is. There's three kind of core designs that we can do uh, with lenses. I'm sure uh, some folks from the Classic Lenses podcast will, uh, will reprimand me for this very, very simplistic explanation, but we have a normal long focus lens, which the focal length, that's however much draw we need to achieve infinity focus with the lens. We have a telephoto design, which needs less bellows draw to do that. And then we have a retro focus design, which retro focus actually is a lens that is designed to be pushed out further to achieve the same thing. This was a, a thing that doesn't happen so much anymore, but happened in the SLR days to achieve really crazy big glass and big apertures, uh, but then still kind of get that onto a smaller little camera uh, or sensor on there. So retrofocus design lenses still baffle me because they're monstrous. Um, it's kind of the same thing baffles me about like big Sigma overcorrected lenses. They're enormous for these tiny little mirrorless cameras, but anyway, Telephoto design lenses, typically what you're trading off when you go for a telephoto or T-design lens is you're trading off that maximum coverage, that maximum image circle. And you're usually also trading off a little bit of, uh, a little bit of sharpness on the corners just to get um, that draw to fit. So in the case of, uh, of David, who we were just talking about, who wanted to get some, uh, some longer stuff, a telephoto or T-design lens can be a workaround if he does end up going with the Toyo or Chamonix H1, which with a smaller bellows draw. So that can be a way out um, and get that sharpness. But you had a really interesting question, Pedro, about the bokeh. And I don't, I won't, I won't say for sure that they will be completely different, but all lenses have their own kind of signature look as it, you know, as it were. I find the telephoto or T design I've worked with don't tend to have a very pleasing bokeh. But 
if you are focusing pretty up close with them, be just because of the nature of that, um, that longer focal length, you are going to get that background way thrown out of focus when you're focusing closer to your subject. So you're bringing that subject closer to you in the lens, which also makes them further from the background, which will enhance that bokeh. And then you have lenses like, uh, like I just talked about in the, uh, the barrel lenses episode, process lenses. I really don't like the bokeh of process lenses. They really don't have it. Uh, even when wide open, they just have kind of a weird look. And I think it's because those lenses are meant to be resolved really, really highly or magnified quite a bit more. So when I make big prints with my process lens uh, stuff, my G Clarion, it looks great. But if I look at it at native size or a little bit bigger, it, it doesn't have a nice bokeh to me. It's kind of ugly. Sometimes I, I call it crunchy. So some of the highlights just do this weird thing that looks like I've added artifacts to the picture. So I would say, will you see a difference in the bokeh? Yes, but you'll probably see other things first, like less image circle and less sharpness as you go toward the corners. But this is like taking pictures of brick wall stuff. So if you're getting this lens to be able to shoot portraits on a camera that has less bellows, go for the telephoto design because otherwise it's just not going to happen. Um, I don't want you to have to buy a new camera just to get a slightly different look. So I would always say try to you know get what works for, for you at the moment. Large format is such a niche and so much used equipment to kind of get out and not lose a lot of money, you know, just experiencing the process. All right, how are the questions? Oh man, we got lots of folks coming in. Perfect. Da -da 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 -da. Cool, got a few more questions rolling in. All right, so Pedro, I hope that helps. Uh, I think going with the telephoto design is a good idea if you don't have that maximum bellows reach going on with your, uh, your existing camera. So the next question we have is from Chris. And Chris writes, hey Matt, love the new channel, thanks. Uh, I've been shooting medium format again and wanted to get into large format. What's the best way to get a full system? I've tried to build a kit out at KEH but can never get something that's start to finish. Uh, I feel like something would always be missing like not being able to find the right lens board or, uh, or the like. Ideally a field camera would have a better setup for me as I'm a landscape photographer. Any recommendations would be great as I'm nervous to go on the bay. I think we all are at, at the end of the day, but Chris, thank you so much for that email. You know, I don't think there are many places where you're going to purchase a start to finish uh, large format kit. There are some online uh, kind of kits that are prepared and fully assembled, but I also find what they're essentially doing is doing that, li that, he that heavy lifting for you and assembling those parts separately and charging a pretty significant, um, upcharge to do that. And I'm not a fan of that. I want to save money. I want to shoot more film. But if a field camera is what you're after, I might recommend trying some dedicated brick and mortar stores. Um, you don't have to just give me a call at Midwest Photo, which you could definitely do. There are places like uh, Fred Newman over at the View Camera Store. Uh, they sell complete start to finish kits uh, along with new and used lenses. Badger Graphic is another, um, another old school brick and mortar shop that still uh, sells complete kits ready to go. Um, are there any others? I'm, I'm sure there's many others that I'm forgetting. Uh, but KEH from time to time has some good stuff. They will also post lots on eBay. I know what you said you were afraid of, but they will post a lot of their lots of lenses and some pre-made kits on their eBay page. Right now they have actually have a whole bunch of barrel and process lenses on there. But for more, details on the field camera if you can send me some like specific things you want to shoot or you know maybe a, a budget range you want to stay under with everything uh, that can maybe kind of help narrow the field but you can't really go wrong with intrepids those are pretty great i would recommend looking at systems that have universal type lens boards so in four by five and five by seven well mostly four by five this would be the Linhoff Technica style lens board so those are the ones that have they're not quite actually i think i have a Linhoff Technica let me put it to the, I'm gonna put it to my computer real quick and I'm gonna get up and move around. Thank goodness for the wireless mic, I can move around. I've got a Linhoff Technica board here in the garage somewhere. Ah, here we go. Linhoff Technica. So, sorry for the break guys. Look at this one, ooh, ebony. You ever wanted to see a $75 lens board? There it is. But anyway, uh, Linhoff Technica lens boards are going to look like this. Some of them will come with a offset hole, so a hole that's not 
completely centered. And this is just for different beds of cameras. So some press bed cameras prefer a recess or not a recess, um, an off center lens board and others will just use a centered lens board. The, uh, this system, the Linhoff Technica style also has this little retainer in there. It's just a little extra light trap. And these guys fit into the bottom. Um, I've seen these from Ebony, Nikon, uh, I think Toyo, like there's a bunch of manufacturers that make these and there's also really generic ones that you can purchase. Four by fives tend to love having these. If you have a system that uses a Linhoff Technica style board, you are set. That'll be a really good route uh, to go down in getting a, a field camera that you don't feel like you're hunting down specialty parts. Once you go up to five by seven and eight by 10, that lens board is now going to increase to a larger size and that larger size is the Cinar style lens board. And boy, do I have Cinar boards in this place. My goodness, there's all my Cinar boards. So Cinar boards, you can see a little bit bigger. They always don't come with a lens. These are five and a quarter inch squares with this little extra retaining lip on the inside. Five by sevens and eight by tens that use that will be kind of your, uh, your standard and really easy to get uh, lenses and lens boards uh, custom made or readily made available. All right, let's see. Oh man, got the questions flowing. Oh, there's Nico in the comments. Yeah, I totally agree, Nico. Can't go wrong with Untrepid unless you want to, uh, to shoot like super, super, super macro. Honestly, they've just revolutionized what you can do for an incredibly small budget. I mean, literally less than a brand new Canon Rebel DSLR, you can get a solid four by five body. And I've been saying this for years prior to Intrepid, even a really terribly made large format camera can last 30 to 40 years. Are you really gonna be shooting this thing so, so, so often that you are gonna be pushing the absolute limits? I always like to tell myself, yeah, sure, I'm gonna shoot this thing so much, but the reality is once or twice a week, that feels like capacity for me. Some power shooting weeks, it's been more like three or four times, but the reality is it's an occasional trip out. I'm usually babying this gear and being a little bit slower with it. So the camera build quality of the Intrepids is plenty to last a long, long time. You can do an entire hobbyist career on, uh, on that type of camera. Mark Full, totally agree. You can get them on the bay for pretty cheap. There's even guys that are making custom made uh, boards. So you give them the, uh, the spacing specifications and the thread pitch and they can make one, which is just really cool. All right, uh, so thanks again, Chris, for that, uh, that question. This next one isn't much a, uh, so much a question as, uh, as a comment, but it's about large format live. So I'm gonna address it. And this is from Caleb H. Huge fan of the videos. Do you think you'll be doing more live darkroom sessions, even if it's printing your own work? Even if it's printing, well, you don't, you don't want to see my own work? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Caleb, thank you so much for the question. Uh, I definitely think that is something that is going to be coming up. The big, big question about getting a darkroom live stream is the interwebs is pretty terrible at the darkroom I currently use. I can barely get like any sort of cell service where, where it's at. So I'm still working the logistics out, but I definitely want to make something like that happen pretty soon. And, you know, you guys... Inform me of this. Let me know what you want to see more in large format live, and I will try to make, make it happen. All right, so I've got a question here from Thomas. Hi, Matt. Great videos. Thank you. So oh, thank you so much, sir. Recently got hold of two large format cameras uh, for six and a half by nine centimeter sheet film. They have front rise and fall and front shift. Do you have any recommendation of what to photograph to get used to the movements? Anything besides architecture? Staying in the center of of a city under a dark clothes, not knowing what to do is my most enjoyable learning experience. Best regards, Thomas from Vienna. Well, thanks, Thomas. So it doesn't just have to be architecture uh, to play around uh, with movements. You can really just play with movements anywhere. Uh, another fun one, if you have, let's see, he has what? Rise, fall, and front shift. Great, if you've got front shift, try to take a self-portrait in a mirror without the camera showing up. See if you can, play around with that. That's always a fun shot to do. And people will be like, wait, how did you do that? Who took the shot? Oh, it was just me. You know, play around with that or try to use the shift and maybe a rise to force a perspective, really just force the viewer to see out of a perspective that doesn't seem possible, but like, wait, wasn't the camera up really far? Or was it, wait, was it down? Like make people ask questions and you can do that by placing objects 
in the foreground of the image, in the background of the image. So we're adding layers of composition as well as just using movements to enhance that composition. So you don't just have to rise the thing all the way up and keep those lines nice and straight. While that looks cool, it does get boring pretty quick. So thanks for that, uh, thanks for that question. Let's see. I'm gonna check back in on the chat real quick. Uh-huh, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to, to, to challenge modes, use tilts and shifts to take a pet photo. All right, so Lauren is bringing up a very, very funny point. So a long time ago, I had a really challenging situation because one, I didn't know how to use lights yet, and I wanted to take a picture of this adorable little puppy named Strudel. And I had this really unique film. It was Ektachrome 64 Tungsten, so which is a tungsten balanced film, and I wanted to try and capture the little guy and well, we did it, but it took quite a bit. I'm gonna see if I can pull up my shot of, of Strudel. Um, did it end up exactly the way I wanted it to? No, but it was, it was actually kind of cool. All right, pull up my Flickr stream. So I had to use insane, insane amounts of movements to get little Strudel there. And you can kind of see, was it a complete success? No. That was like a chewy, it kind of looks like a cast or a bone or just something weird in the shot. But you can see I caught his, I caught one of his eyes, I caught his left eye, the right eye kind of fell out and I got his ear and you can see behind him the backside is just gone. But after hitting him with some hot lights, these were those old, um, oh my gosh, who made those lights? They were like the lights that just catch everything on fire. They weren't Aries, they were the really cheap ones. I'll have to remember the name. Uh, oh, did I say what they were in here? What I baked them with? No, but look at that exposure time, quarter second. I am probably not going to be able to tow, so that kind of uh, kind of helped out with the situation. Um, all right, that, that, that was one. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> Lauren's making so Lauren will fill you guys in on extra details of a uh, uh, poor little strudel during that shoot. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it all happens so fast. And whenever you see a dog that's like, like smiling in the shot, it's because they're dying kind of like I am in this, uh, this 80 degree de garage right now. They're just overheated a little bit. All right, let's hit up some, uh, we're almost to the end of the, the preset questions and then we'll get to some more chat questions. Uh, so got one from Joe. Joe says, thanks, uh, thanks much for the video on the topic. And I believe this was to the, um, to the brass, uh, the barrel lenses topic. Um, but, but, but my question is about recommendations of where I might start to look for pets fall lenses that will cover eight by 10. I've tried some places, but have run into inconsistencies regarding info and not so good customer service. Oh, that's not fun. Uh, so I just kind of put it on the back burner, so to speak. Anyway, if you could recommend something, I'd appreciate the help. Finally, I know price can be all over the place, but would you be able to provide some sort of guide? Clearly you pay for what you get, but there's could be a range. Um, any, anything would be helpful. All right. So Joe, I've got some mixed news for you. Pets fall lenses are hot. They have been hot since about the late 2000s when wet plate was kind of starting to come back a little bit. There was murmurings um, and more people were starting to offer like boutique workshops and getaway events and teaching each other the, the process. And while that's great, what's happened is the market just kind of started gobbling those things up as this niche demand turned into like kind of this reseller heaven. They had these lenses that they were literally turning into like paperweights and like desk ornaments and shelf ornaments to multiple like hundreds and thousands of dollars in some cases. So if you're looking for an actual like pets ball style lens, if you're looking for a name brand one, uh, like a Dahlmeyer or a Darlow, you are more than likely going to spend 1500 to to 3000 dollars to get just a, like a base coverage eight by 10 lens. And typically when it comes to those, uh, those pets fall style lenses where it's sharp in the center and just gets wild in the corners because there's no like modern corrections for them, you're going to be looking at lenses that are starting a little bit longer than your standard focal length. They're going to be like your 12 inch, 13 inch, 14 inch, by the way, it's not just because I'm in the U S that I always say these inches, that's how those lenses were marketed. So I try to be accurate to what you would be searching for on that lens. Some lenses were also stated in millimeters, but the early ones were stated in inches and then they kind of branched out from there. So that's why I'm doing that. It's not like me pushing the pushing America when I, <laughs> when I talk about uh, standard versus metric, that's just what it is. So 
for real pet small lenses, you're gonna pay a big, big price unless you just get really hooked up at a used camera auction. But even at auctions anymore, you know, everybody has their phone and can kind of figure things out really quick. So they can say, oh, I see one that's listed for four grand. Let me snap that up. So those, you're not gonna get crazy deals that much anymore. I would recommend looking on the large format photography forum that I've recommended a few times on the show. Um, there are some private dealers that do have those, but they know what they have too. So you're going to be paying, they're just going to adjust their prices for the market, whether they're selling or not. So um, one, one uh, private dealer that I have worked with before in the past, I don't think I'm going to show his site, but one dealer I've worked with in the past, his name is Igor Camera. Check him out. He's out of Cleveland, Ohio. If you can, try to try to talk with him. Don't, uh, I don't, I've not had good email stuff back and forth with him, but he is a, uh, he's a good reseller um, and pretty good in person because I've, I've dealt with him in person uh, and over the phone, but the email there, there's like some, sometimes stuff gets lost, you know? So for real pet smalls, you're looking higher tier. If you're looking for projector lenses, you can find projector lenses that cover eight by 10 and process lenses. You can find those for anywhere from like a dollar a millimeter to $2 a millimeter. So like a 300 or 400 millimeter lens for anywhere from uh, three to 600 bucks is kind of your standard range. There are some really inflated ones that you'll see on eBay that if you just watch them for more than a week, you'll realize, oh, they've been up there like that forever and haven't really sold. So that'll be kind of a good, uh, a good place to start. Let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Hey, Mike, my buddy Mike's on here. Mike Rosso, how you doing, man? All right. Oh man, we are getting so much interaction. This is great, guys. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna go back to the question real quick, make sure I'm not like skipping anything over. Da, 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 da. Yeah, as far as picking up a, as far as picking up a Petsfall lens, try not to look for a Petsfall. See if, uh, I would take a look at some of the different projector lenses and maybe like old Tessar lenses. I think the look of those is great. You can still find, um, early Tessar lenses, like 300 millimeter. Um, I think they're like 4.5 or F4. Those are great lenses. They have a cool look to them and they're not gonna cost near as much as like a Petsfall. They're a different design lens, but I like the look of those. I don't have the super expensive taste. There are some folks that are also making reproduction, uh, brand new brass versions of Petsfall lenses, but those are, whew, those are pretty crazy priced. And I would definitely not be the expert for that. So um, thanks for that question. All right, still got 40 bucks on there, so hey. Thanks so much, guys. Um, next question I've got. This one came in. I had a few that came in just before the show. So this one's from uh, Farid, uh, Farid L. He says, uh, can you tell me what size the Lysengang John are? Okay, so that was that, that was that monster projector lens we had on the last episode uh, is covering. Did you see its bokeh? Um, I might get one, but not sure if I should go for it. Thanks for the help, Farid from Switzerland. Farid, I didn't actually get a chance to see the bokeh myself. I should have tried to mount it to something. Unfortunately, that thing had a monster nine inch lens board. You can usually bet if it comes on a nine inch lens board, it covers at least eight by 10, perhaps even 10 by 12. That specific one, I asked Ed about it. And 480 millimeter lenses are typically going to be an 11 by 14 lens. And that one was also something that was used for 11 by 14. Now, Ed shoots 8x10, which actually makes it a little bit more of a portrait focal length lens, kind of pushes you further back from the subject and still getting a tight crop. So that's what he was using it for. And if you go on Ed's Instagram, which I supplied in the link for the barrel lenses episode, some pretty ridiculous shallow depth of field stuff. Um, just for comparison, I'm going to go grab a, a lens really quick. This is great. I love just doing this from the studio because I can just like, hey, let's pull a thing. Let's answer a question. So this is 80 millimeter f8.4. And that sounds like slow as all get out if you shoot four by five or anything smaller. But on eight by 10 and even 11 by 14, it's just like an insanely shallow depth of field. It's kind of like what part of what eyelash, what one eyelash do you want in sharp focus when you're shooting this at portrait distance? It's kind of crazy. So imagine like three point, like anything less than F4, that's like insane, insane shallow depth of field. It's gonna be an awesome look, but it is gonna be super, super crazy. Almost like that strudel shot I was showing. You're gonna have these crazy shallow elements and you might have to start employing um, movements to get a little bit better, a uh, little bit better coverage going on. One little trick I have is I tilt the front standard a little bit back and that tries, that accounts for any of this kind of drifting front to back that your subject might do during that. Okay. 
Um, is that my last one? Okay, that was the last of my, that was the last of our questions that took place before the stream. So I'm gonna start going up through the chat and reading a few questions and shout outs and all that good stuff. So let's get to it. And we still got still got a little bit left on the stream. We can probably get through, get some questions cleared up. All right. <laughs> oh yeah, I did. No, I did copy pasta one of them. Let's see. Um, yeah, this was from uh, from Einer. Uh, any three hundred millimeter lens you would recommend for eight by ten field? Yes. If you can get your hands on a Schneider three hundred millimeter f five point six, you don't have to go Apo or any of the crazy expensive ones. Um, just like a 300 millimeter Sim RS um, or Siren RS, like those are great 300s or 360s. You can also look at uh, the modern Nikkor, the, the Nikkor 300W. That's an awesome lens, super, super tack sharp from corner to corner. There's also, you can also look at the Nikon 300W. Uh, um, no, the, sorry, Fuji. Uh, Fuji made a 300. Uh, the writing on the inside of the barrel. Those lenses are probably going to be your smallest 300 millimeter 5.6, but they're an older design lens. So you might be a little bit dreamier in the corners and might have to stop down a little bit more. But all of those lenses I just recommended, like hands down, those are great 300 millimeter lenses and they're not going to break the bank. Once you start looking at 300s that are like F4, F4.5, now you're talking process lenses or pets falls or just crazy stuff. If you're looking for something modern, can't beat that Nikkor, Schneider, C um, Rodenstock, Cenars, those are all going to be great options to consider uh, in a 300. All right, I'm going to head back to the uh, the old chat here. All right, da, 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 da. let's see, I got, got Eric, got Inar. cool, cool. All right, this one's from Blake. Thanks for your question, Blake. Hi, Matt. What's your preferred filter system for your Cenar? I shoot with an F2 and I'm unsure whether to invest in a circular filter system or purchase the Cenar filter holder system with square filters. Well, it's really funny you should mention that because um, we recently had one of those Cenar filter systems come into uh, my work at Midwest Photo. And I was looking at the filter system and I was like, huh, this could really be something that works pretty well. So the way the Cenar, I don't have one. I haven't purchased it yet. Don't worry, Lauren. I didn't purchase it. I might though. The Cenar filter system attached to the, uh, the little accessory rods that go on the front standard of the Cenar, and they had like a little flip in front, and it was a they had a square system you could get or a circular system, which those were a monster 138 millimeter um, round filter. But they also had glass and gel filter inserts with a lot of very fine tuned color correction that you could get into. If you're going to pay close to new prices, you might as well get a square filter system because then you're getting the most modern ones that are also like IRND, like all the crazy stuff that you could also use on a digital system. Wait, we can do show and tell. I forgot. I'm in the studio. Hold on. Let me uh, get out of the uh, the crazy the crazy view we had it before. I might just there. I'll I'll leave it on Chamonix's page. Free marketing for Chamonix. How's that? Um, where's my filters? There they are. So I use a View filter system. So View is the same distributor that makes the uh, the Toyo stuff. Uh, View is, I think, now Benro filters. They're a tripod company, but they also are more like cinema based. I think this filter holder is great. It's not fancy like the Wine Country camera or whatever, but it has inserts for um, two drop-ins of either four by four or four by six size, um, and I can add extra ones or remove them if it's too thick. Um, the back also allows me to add on up to a 95 millimeter front ring and it supports circular polarizers by rotating that in the back. So that's pretty great. I got this mainly for doing black and white, but I also found when I took it to Africa, I was using it for uh, color correction as well because I was shooting some slide film and I had to be able to correct that in camera. Usually I roll with uh, standard color correction filters, yellow, red, orange, things like that. And then in the big guy, I also have some grad NDs. Ooh, those look really nice on the background. So uh, that's like a soft grad, doesn't have a hard line in it. I also have one hard one. And this one I can reverse like this or bring it up like there. The hard thing is you're never gonna have a perfect horizon, but if I just need a hard cut, that works pretty well. So that system, the square system works pretty well. And you're also not beholden to like Ex old accessories that might not necessarily be made anymore. So that's um, that's another consideration when you're looking at filter systems. If it is for large format though, 
sometimes this isn't big enough. If it's four by five, go with the square system. There's just more options out there in different price ranges. If you can get the CNR system for like nothing, like a dream, yeah, go for it. Get the CNR. Make sure the set comes with a bunch of filters though. You don't want to be like assembling stuff and, uh, and paying just crazy prices for like that one thing you needed to make it work. All right, I'm just kind of moving stuff away from the old desk here and we're gonna get some more chat questions. By the way, guys, thank you so much for like hanging around with us. This has been a lot of fun. I hope this Q and A is, is interactive enough. I never want the channel to feel like a one way conversation because I'm learning things too. And uh, I, I still don't feel like an expert at this stuff, but I have been doing it long enough that I can answer pretty confidently on a decent range uh, of those questions. So let's keep these things going. All right. Uh, ta -ta. So I got Blake. Mm -hmm. uh, so Chris in the chat, Chris Adams said, where should I go to get started? I don't trust eBay. Inventory seems really low on all the places I looked. Yes. <laughs> Inventory um, isn't the largest. And it's because a lot of places really don't want to have that risk just sitting there. Intrepid is getting their money towards. So um, that's might, uh, you know, might be an indicator of, uh, of where stock's at. But I know personally, you know, I work at a mom and pop shop that sells digital. Digital is the bread and butter. Accessories for digital is the bread and butter. They're not going to have a large inventory uh, of new large format cameras. The, most of them will be special order. But even that special order process with uh, USA and, uh, and other manufacturers is pretty quick. Pre-COVID times. It's all kind of crazy right now. But I know with some of the US manufacturers, they still are producing, making cameras, great service. And I wouldn't, um, I would be doing a disservice to the community if I didn't mention my one favorite large format camera manufacturer because I have wanted one of his cameras for years. And I just think he is a great guy to know. That's Mr. Keith Canham of KB Canham Cameras. Uh, the website, super simplistic, but he has a few different models of large format cameras. There are a lot of places that can still order this. I'm one of them over at Midwest Photo, but they have traditional field cameras, wood field and metal cameras. These things are built like tanks, but they do have their own unique learning curve. So there is, uh, you do have to kind of get used to that type of camera. It's not something you're gonna pick up. It's just a different rack and pinion type system, but it, they are built like tanks. And the users that have given, uh, given it a chance and learned with it, they usually love them. They're like Keith customers for life. The cameras don't have a lifetime guarantee, but Keith takes care of his customers like they do. So that's another great thing. And he's someone that you can like shoot him an email, pick up the phone and he answers your questions. That's something that just doesn't happen anymore. Well, it's happening right now in the live stream, but that's a whole different story. All right, let's check some more questions. All right. All right, this is from Matt McFerrin. I have zero experience shooting large format, but I would like to get into it. I do have a lot of experience with 35 and 120. What would you recommend for my first large format camera? Well, Matt, I'm sounding like a, bro a broken record now, but if you want to get something brand spanking new, the Intrepids are sweet. If you don't mind something used, Wistas and Takaharas are a great way to go. The stock on those is dwindling because fewer and fewer are made brand new. And the ones that are breaking down are either just trapped in attics, basements or adorning people's shelves. So that inventory is less and less, but I love folding field cameras. I think they have a lot of versatility. And one thing, I don't, haven't really talked about this too much on the show, but my first camera was one that I just, I like hated it because I told myself that, oh, it's the, the camera. That's the reason I'm not a good photographer. It's definitely not the fact that I just haven't shot enough and don't know my way around developing and all the different tools involved. It was totally just the camera. And then one thing changed my perspective. So the camera I had, it was called the Eastman Commercial B. Actually, I can probably find myself with the camera. Eastman Commercial, if I can spell. So Eastman Commercial B. Hey, look, who's that kid? Oh my God, is that like, yeah, the first few, oh, it's because my buddy Mike posted them. Yeah, so like there's me in my native habitat with my camera. That guy right there, that's Spencer Cunningham. He's the guy that, that's his camera. I actually ended up giving it back to him with an extra lens and some film and stuff to get it working. That camera, I used to think that that camera was holding me back, but that thing is a magnesium monster. It's the same design as the Kodak 2D from the early 1900s. 
It was built out of magnesium. It was super lightweight. It folded up really easy, kind of like that Chamonix H1, but it had a front bed. And it was awesome. And it wasn't until I saw a video of Ansel Adams working with that exact same camera on a beach in like the late 40s or 50s that I was like, oh yeah, the camera has nothing to do with it. It's totally all your experience. So to a certain degree, I think almost any camera you go with, if you can see yourself using the camera and you're genuinely excited about it, you're gonna make it work. Don't get caught up in all the different reviews and even to an extent, my recommendations, because I don't have your experience. I don't want to do what you want to do with the camera. So if you can, if you seem excited about it, don't let somebody who's angry on the internet that you don't personally know, like it. play around with it. There's so many cool cameras. There, there could be custom ones out there that just, they, they feel right. You know, there's lots of different types of cameras I haven't even talked about on the channel yet that I think are worth exploring. And I'm gonna seek out experts with those cameras, talk to them and share my findings with you guys. That's the whole plan. You know, we're kind of learning through this together. So if you're starting, my recommendation is always gonna be a folding field type camera. Since the Intrepid Mark III, that's the first one I recommend just because it keeps your costs low. The entry level risk is not so bad because there are so many out there and the price point starting is low, you might not make a full return on that initial upfront cost. So you might lose a couple bucks playing with it, but you only spent a couple bucks to find out that maybe this wasn't for you. That's another thing I haven't chatted about on this channel. Some folks, they have to shoot 10, 20, 100 sheets of film to find out, you know, I don't think I like large format. And that's okay too. The pace is different. So if you can see yourself going through those motions, that's another question to ask yourself. So if you have a buddy that's into large format, or if you make the trip up to Columbus, Ohio, hit me up. I'm usually in the shop surrounded by large format cameras. We can see if it feels right for you. That's the whole, that's what this is all about. It's getting your hands on it and enjoying it. All right, let's see how, how we're doing on the questions. All right, so thanks Matt again for that question. All right, oh, so Eric we've emailed before, previously emailed you about tripod options for my four x five monorail. Thanks for your answer. Is it unreasonable to take that camera in the field? <laughs> okay, that is an awesome question, Eric, because I will let you find out the answer to that because I, I did it. I have done it. I hauled my Cinar P2 out in the field. Uh, Lauren can attest to this if she's still watching the channel. I took a 70 pound Pelican case that doesn't even fit on this table uh, down to Savannah, Georgia and I hauled it around. And I think people just let me into places because it looked like I was hauling a coffin around with this monster, monster tripod on me. It was crazy. And by the end of that trip, I feel like I slept for like three or four days because I was just in pain. Like everything was on fire when um, I was done. And it was on this really heavy old Manfrotto tripod with that went up to like nine feet tall and it held a million pounds. I had like a divot in my shoulder at the end of each day that I worked with that, uh, that camera and tripod. So if you don't feel like you have the back for any, the monorail camera normal, just move around the studio try moving it, uh, you know, a few hundred feet or, uh, or even longer from the car and see how that works. I think it was, it's either an Weston or, uh, Weston or an Adams quote, uh, anything more than a hundred meters from the car isn't photogenic. I totally, totally get that some days that that is totally my vibe. Like, yeah, let's just shoot it from the corner here. That, that's fine. All right. Let's see. Uh, get some more questions. Whoa, Tariq. I didn't even notice Tariq in the chat. My man, my brother, I miss you. I miss you, Tariq. We need to hang out. We need to shoot again. Like, where are you? Come over. Come on. I, I know you're all... Get over here. Come on. Shoot. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's see. Next one. Hey, Tom's in the chat. Tom Thacker. All right. How's it going, Tom? I've been having issues with the rotating back of my Intrepid, considering replacing it. Tom, what's going on with the back of your camera? Is it not seating properly? Uh, or is it, uh, is it coming off? Like is the, are, are the springs like not holding or the, the locking knobs? Let me know. Okay. Da, 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 da. All right. This one is from Ganzonomy. Hey Matt, Epic Channel. I was wondering what your view on using vintage versus modern lenses and do you feel that modern lenses have become too perfect? I think I was like even alluding to that a little bit earlier. I think modern digital lenses, and this is digital, this isn't like film in large format. 
I really feel like digital lenses have, they're chasing perfect so much that they're almost like losing sight of the, of the intent of like having a smaller system. I really don't mind, actually show and tell time. I'm gonna jump to, uh, I'll jump to a picture of me, of me and my adopted mom, Leslie. There we go, there's, there's me and Leslie. Oh my gosh, look at that young lad. He didn't have hair. He didn't know, he didn't know what he would become. Anyway, uh, show and tell time. This is the thing that I shoot the video on my channel with. This is a, uh, it's a Fuji X Pro 3. And if you ask any video shooter or forum member or social media person, they're gonna say, an X Pro 3, that thing sucks at video. And they're kind of right. But for what I do, it's fine. We got lights, we got sound, you guys can hear me and see me, it's good. Some of my favorite lenses for this thing are ones that get dog reviews and are just dirt cheap lenses. So this is a seven artisans, uh, 55 millimeter lens. This lens was less than 150 bucks. It's fast, it's dreamy, and it is nowhere near optically correct. But I love the look of it. Anyway, when it comes to large format, we're keeping this thing about large format. There is a distinct look when it comes to different types of large format lenses. And I can get people's reasons for doing better, for sure. I tend to like the look of the modern, you know, your modern triple coated or your APO coated lenses. I love the look of it. It's like crisp. And when you pair it with a process that might have some like artifacts and softness to it, I think it looks really cool. But I've also started kind of going down this dark path of soft focused lenses. Here pretty soon we're gonna be talking about pinhole. Anyway, so, yeah, sharpness, it's, it doesn't always have to be like ble eye bleedingly sharp. It doesn't have to be so sharp you're not sure what soft is anymore, right? It's, it's all a balance. I do think that you have, wanna consider how you're going to display the picture that you're taking, which is like, wait, how am I gonna know what I wanna shoot? You'll know. Like, is this something that you wanna make a contact print of? Is this something that you want to make super, super enlarged, huge? Because yeah, then a modern lens that can resolve higher or a process lens that can resolve at higher magnifications is gonna make more sense than something super soft and dreamy. But if you're just doing big contact prints or shooting ultra large format, well, maybe, the, uh, maybe that softer lens will have just a nicer roll off and look better when at the native contact print or, uh, or modest enlargement size. So I'm, I'm kind of on the fence, but I'm leaning toward the lens isn't always the issue, but it, it helps. It is your look, right? The camera's a box, the, the lens is your look. All right, let's see, this is from Max Shoots Film. Have you ever heard of a large format camera with a bayonet mount lens board? I don't know, I don't think so. There's something close to that though. I know your, uh, your compact cameras, kind of like the, the camera dactyl, the 3D printed one, those cameras have a, a different type focus mount called like a helicoid, which it rotates, the mount rotates, which slowly pushes the barrel. Um, I don't know of one that's bayonet. It might be like an aerial lens might have a bayonet because that's big and has like a huge locking flange. I think the reason that we don't experience bayonet or quick change mounts is because we have these retaining rings um, and flanges to work with. Uh, another thing that I guess you could consider kind of close is that CNR shutter system, but that's a two-way street and you're kind of replacing the shutter with it. So that's a good question. I'm gonna look that one up and make sure I'm not like talking out my butt here. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Someone retracted a message, oh no. Hopefully it was okay. Um, oh, Terry B says the 7RS lens on my, my ONF. Oh, OMF, okay, for shooting black and white mode, two squares, looks so sweet, so old school. I totally agree. Sometimes the soft look just, just looks pretty good. All right, <laughs> Eric says pinhole, yes. Yeah, I, I'm kind of excited for it. Um, I haven't really worked with pinhole in large format in a long time. I received a pinhole as a gift uh, years and years ago at the uh, photo stock photo festival. This is back in like 2012 or 2013 from this really, really creative lady. Uh, Judy Sherrod, rest in peace, Judy, you, you are remembered. Um, she was an awesome pinhole artist that would work with another super, super talented lady, Miss S. Gail Stevens, just a brilliant artist. Um, and I never ended up using it or mounting it to a board. And I was always kicking myself like, ah, oh, I just need to play with pinhole. And now I have the opportunity. So uh, look forward to that in a few weeks. Um, all right, did I, whoa, 
Did we catch? No, I didn't catch up on. No, I, I like super scrolled. Oh my gosh, there's so many questions. Oh my gosh. All right, I'm probably not going to get to them all, but I, I will try and try and try to do as many uh, before my batteries die because that's the big thing that we're running into here. We've just hit an hour. Um, long, okay, so I have a question from... Um, ba, ba, ba. Oh, uh, David asked, what uh, camera did I use to shoot most of the black and white landscapes? Most of the landscapes on my site, David, uh, were done with the combination of my Eastman Commercial B and my Takahara double extension. So that would be really similar to like a Wista. Um, at the end of the day, the camera, it's like such a super minimal thing. My camera honestly is like beat up. It's got scratches. The only thing it doesn't have is termites, okay? Like it, it like baseline gets the job done. And I, I fear that if I ever got something better, I would just like ruin it. <laughs> like if I ever got that Arca Swiss that I, I've always wanted or like that Canon camera I've always wanted, I would just like ruin it or something. The Takahara, I'm like ready to take risks with, right? Because we've been through so much. Um, uh, bah, 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 bah. Um, <laughs> oh, this is a good question. John Greenwood asks, um, thanks for the time. Why is my 300 millimeter F9 way brighter on the ground glass than my 90 millimeter F9? Oh, oh, oh. It all has to do with magnification. So a 300 millimeter um, at F9, on an eight by 10, you have a wider viewing glass with which to take it in. It's casting a larger circle, the, um, the center of which is gonna look really bright and you're looking at a really, really close magnification. With a 90 millimeter that's at F9, a wide angle lens is typically going to have a little bit of vignetting going on. So you're seeing, you're seeing almost that full image circle and you're seeing that dramatic fall off happening. The same thing happens if you would put like a 150 or a 165 on an eight by 10, that would um, that would do the same thing. Now, if you're talking about why is a 300 F9 on your four by five a little bit brighter, same reason, you're seeing the, the cleanest, sharpest part of that image circle. Um, and it's really nice and even from corner to corner where a 90 just gets a little bit darker. Super wide angle lenses are also super hard to view. My only other recommendation in 90s Sometimes you can find 90 millimeter lenses that are like 5.6 or 4.5. A lot of those lenses uh, will have to be stopped down significantly to get back that full coverage, that full image circle. They're only made at 4.5 just so you can see them brightly on the ground glass. So they're kind of giving you more light, but you also have to stop it down more what, to your working aperture to get there. All right, let's see. Oh, Sam Fami. Hey, Sam, we got to get together about like, you know, working with the camera sometime. This is the first and only channel I've subscribed to. Wow, thanks, man. Uh, it's been great helpfully. Would you consider doing LF Photo Walk? Absolutely. Once I can do so with safety and maybe without a mask on. But yes, um, I would definitely consider doing a large format photo walk. It is something that like has to happen. It totally has to happen. Uh, I have too many people from all over the world that are buzzed about this and a good amount in like this Midwest corridor that it would be worth um, it would definitely be worth doing a, a photo walk or like a walking workshop with one. I'm, I'm itching to get out. Trust me. <laughs> um, oh, Mike answered my question. Yes, it was the lull total lights, Mike. You know, because I've seen one of those pop in your studio and I have almost burnt down the University of Finley with one. So yes, that is it. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, okay. I think I like caught up with some of the questions and then like skipped through. We are, we're getting there though, guys. We are getting there. Oh man, uh huh. -huh. So Joe, Joe B1, nice. Uh, I inherited an ebony four x five camera, but have left it on the shelf due to fear of developing the film. I don't have a darkroom, just Patterson tank. Should I get a darkroom before breaking out the four x five? Great question. I have a somewhat biased recommendation. All right, jumping to a picture of me wearing a fancy sweater. That was at the Photo Plus show a few years ago, and I was uh, stupid enough to bring <laughs> the Eastman into the Javits Center. Uh, what was I looking for? Oh, I was looking for the thing I was going to recommend to you. Oh, did I bring it in? Oh, maybe I didn't bring it in the garage today. Oh, no. Well, I have something branded from him that we'll have to do. Uh, yes, there we go. Branding, pass it on. Um, I've got... Man, I really thought I had the holder here. It's probably in the house. Oh, goodness. All right. So if you just have a Patterson tank, as long as you have a Patterson three-reel tank or larger, 
I recommend getting something from the folks over at 20th Century Camera. So full disclosure, Jeff over at 20th Century Camera, he's a good dude. I've chatted with him on social media. I've tested some products out for him. Um, so this is not like a sponsored sort of thing. Jeff, if you're considering sponsor me, hit me up. But he makes these awesome reels that will work with Jobo Multi-Tanks, Patterson Systems, and he is, he's a photographer first and a maker second. So he has a wide variety uh, of stuff. He even has tutorial videos, super great guy. If you ever have questions, you can hit him up and the products are pretty cool. So he's got um, a lot of different solutions from uh, smaller than four by five upwards of ultra large format. So check that out. That's my, uh, that's kind of my answer to that. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, Joe T, I use a Canon Field 8x10, excellent camera, customer service is on point. He's, yes, 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 Joe, thank you. I love Keith's cameras. One of these days, it is the dream. I would love to own a Canham 12x20. Ever since I saw it at the Javits Center back in 2011, I fell in love. Maybe one day, I don't know. That's a big camera. <laughs> but I love Keith's cameras. The design, the craftsmanship, and just the, yeah, the customer service. It's, it's on point. All right. <laughs> okay, my 54s are recommended for Patterson's. That's another good one. Uh-huh. <laughs> Derek K, only people in the UK call it 5x4. Yep, that's... It's because they're better than us. Like that's that's why I don't say ten by eight because I haven't earned that right. I, I haven't. It's eight by ten here. All right. Uh, what to develop for film? The Jobo is almost six hundred. Jobos can be even more than that. Easiest way, honestly, I do trays. I'm kind of old school when I recommend that. So tray processing, kind of shuffling the sheets. It's great. Now, the one caveat I'll add to that is if you're out west and you have like those really nice even skies. Even skies will test your metal. <laughs> they will make sure that your process is 110% on point because if it is not, if your process is even a little bit off, you will see some unevenness, some waviness in those skies and that's just not fun. Nobody wants that to happen. All right. Okay, Tom's saying that uh, the back won't turn very easily. Yeah, I would, um, I would get, the, get them on the horn, hit them up on social media. You know, don't put them on blast or anything, but they should be able to help you out there. Um, <laughs> sweet. Oh, sweet. Shannon Palmer coming to the rescue talking about Jeff's Reels 20th Century Camera. Good to see you again, Shannon. All right. Uh, let's see. Who else? Uh, Terry B, going to break out my 65 for 4x5 and shoot some panoramic. Ooh. So are you getting like a panoramic back or are you just shooting like big wide vistas and cropping it later? I really like the use of like a six by 12 back um, on four by five. It has a really nice clean look. That'd be pretty cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, steer impressed. Yep, thanks Nico, that's another good solution. All right, lots of good back and forth. Cool. I'm out west right near the HOA Dreamforce. I've always been gray skies. Ah, okay, cool. Well, you know, we've been going, we've gone a lot, uh, we've gone on a little bit longer than I wanted to. I wanted to thank Everybody for being here today. I've had, I've had like, oh my gosh, 46, 47. That's crazy. Thank you so much for staying, you know, sticking in uh, with, the, uh, with the program. If you have any questions, feel free to hit me up. It's largeformatquestions at gmail.com. I try to respond to every email within a few days. If I get more and more of them, I'm probably going to end up doing another live stream just like this one. Uh, but I also want to try and work in a darkroom live stream and also hang out with my buddy Tariq because I miss him. So largeformatquestions at gmail.com if you have any of those questions. Oh, okay, cool. Terry's looking to do uh, Panarch something larger. Yes, totally. Uh, yeah, cropping after the fact is no problem. You have so much real estate on 4 by 5 It's super easy to do. All right, thanks. Thanks, everybody, so much. Um, shoot me an email if you have any questions. Uh, stay tuned for the next episode of Large Format Friday where I'm going to have a new topic and a special announcement that I'm really excited about, but I can't tell you guys about it yet. So you're going to have to stay tuned and uh, we'll see you then. So take it easy, guys.